Good morning, it's June the 3rd. My name is Joe Haynes. I'm the preaching elder at Beacon Church in Victoria, BC. I want to welcome you to this morning devotional as we continue on in a theme of being ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, this morning I want to do something a little bit different. Yesterday we were looking at 2 Peter at the very end of the letter of 2 Peter in chapter 3 and we read about uh, Peter, especially in verse 18, uh, giving us a command to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, earlier in that paragraph, uh, Peter talks about waiting for Jesus to come back with a sense of eager longing and anticipation, uh, especially uh, uh, around making um, sure, being diligent, that when he comes back, he would find us as people who are without spot or blemish and at peace. And you know as well as I do, as, as our hearts break over the uh, unrest uh, south of our border, uh, it, it, it is so challenging for us to, to know as a people, what do we say in a time like this? But th those uh, um, upheavals and, and, and riots expose something that's, I think, true in the human heart. And I'm not talking about the racism uh, that exists. I'm, here I'm talking about the unhappiness that exists in the human heart. And we often try and grasp at various ways of, of soothing the unhappiness in our hearts. Uh, and here Peter is assuming that there is a, a joy, that Peter is assuming there is a gladness, an eagerness about waiting for Christ to come back. And this morning, I want to address that uh, lack of happiness in our hearts. Um, and uh, just to, to, to make an assumption. Here, I want to make an assumption that, uh, that no matter whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or, uh, you know, uh, for five months, that I want to make an assumption that we are not as happy as we ought to be. And uh, so this morning, as uh, we carry along in the theme of being ready for the return of Jesus Christ, I want to focus on happiness. And to do that, I thought, what better place to go to than Psalm 32? Let's uh, pray, and then I'll read this psalm, and we'll discuss uh, the first portion of this psalm this morning and carry on tomorrow for the rest. Psalm 32, let's pray. Uh, Father, we ask your blessing now on us as we... Uh, open up this ancient psalm that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, that these words would come, begin to come alive, and that, Lord, you would guide us for the sake of our growth in the, in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. And I ask that you would do this, Lord, to fulfill your work in us, to make us children who are pleasing to you while we wait for the return of your Son. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so look with me at Psalm 32, and let's read the whole thing. And over the next few sessions of these uh, morning devotionals, uh, we'll, we'll tackle a couple of verses at a time. So Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with brit and, and bridle, or it will not stay, stay, stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This morning we're going to look at just the first couple of verses, uh, uh, maybe the two sets, uh, see how time goes. Um, but first we see, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
the the main idea in the psalm i think yeah it's a psalm written by david and we see that in the in the heading just before verse one you see uh, a masculine of david and if you have a, a, a footnote like i do in my english standard version bible there's a little footnote beside that word masculine and it goes down to the bottom of the page and says probably it's a musical or liturgical uh, term but you know some scholars uh uh, believe that this term has something to do with teaching, uh, instruction. And I think the main idea of this psalm, written by King David, is that uh, if you stop resisting God, if you stop resisting God, then God will teach you happiness. And we start to see that right at the beginning, th these two themes of, be of God teaching and of happiness. Uh, first, in the, the title of the psalm, the heading says that this is a masculine, and that that term, again, probably something to do with learning and being instructed. Uh, and so what are we going to learn in the psalm? And the first words of the psalm open that up. As David says, blessed, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. And then he repeats that uh, several times. This word blessed in Hebrew is a word that means happiness. Uh, not not all the time. I mean, the, the, uh, for example, um, Psalm 31, just on the opposite side of the page, uh, verse 21 uses the word blessed in English as well, but that's a different Hebrew word altogether. In Psalm 32, verse 1, uh, this word blessed is translated from a Hebrew word that, that means happy. It's talking about happiness. Uh, and uh, here, uh, this happiness is something we're going to learn that's why it's a masculine. It's a psalm of instruction and of teaching. So here we are to learn happiness. And I think, well, well what better place uh, than Psalm 32 to learn happiness? Uh, what are we supposed to be thinking about happiness? Uh, as, we, as we look at this, I think this is surprising. One reason why I brought this up this morning and, and chose this psalm is because we look for happiness in all the wrong places. Uh, we look for happiness in, in uh, finally getting something that you've uh, been uh, longing for and you save up some money and you buy it and you order it and finally the, the UPS guy brings it to your door and, and it's a moment of happiness as you unwrap the thing you've been waiting for. Or you, you wait for happiness in, in a relationship and, and uh, you dream about what that relationship will be like and finally you have that person in your life and, and uh, you, you know the, the honeymoon's over and ordinary life begins to set in and you realize it wasn't quite what you were hoping for. Uh, you, you look for happiness in a job where you feel like, you know, if only I had that job, if only that's what I got to do every day. And you work towards uh, getting into a particular career and finally you do and you realize, oh, it's not all it was cracked up to be. Uh, we always seem to aim for things to make us happy or long for things. It's, it's always as if there's something out there that if only I could get that in here, I would finally be happy. Uh, but it's interesting to me that in the psalm, happiness is found by beginning to recognize our sin. That's so counterintuitive. This is, in fact, I think one of the things that we run from. We run from being confronted with our sin. Uh, we think that, that if only we could escape our guilt and escape our shame and escape any condemnation at all, then, then uh, we would be happy. And yet, this instructional psalm about happiness seems to teach us differently than that. Um, this first verse detonates just what I think is a massive idea. It, it kind of blows up in every mind that reads these words, that the basic idea of happiness is found in having our sin dealt with. Uh, and, and I think this is so important for you and me. I know it is for me. Um, the, the first couple of verses here show us the, the conditions for happiness. And the first one is, again, as I've said, so counterintuitive that the road to happiness and to freedom uh, begins with the realization that we're sinners. It begins with the realization that we're not free, that we're not unaccountable, that we do have, uh, uh, we do owe a, 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 an accounting to God for our sin. There is a judgment. There is a judge. So we start with this assumption that all people are sinners, that that we have transgressions that need to be forgiven. That's verse one. That we have sin that needs to be covered. That's verse one. That we have iniquity. 
uh, that, that, that God has a right to confront and God has a right to hold us accountable for our iniquity. That's verse 2. That we have deceit in our spirit. Uh, all these things uh, are we start we start with these assumptions and it's it's um, it's the first condition to happiness to begin to confess that we have this sin that this is true about us uh, that that uh, that we are sinners before God and the second condition is is that somehow some way it's possible that our, our sins could be forgiven that's the second condition for true happiness, I think, here. Uh, that that uh, our sin can be uh, covered, our transgressions can be forgiven. Uh, our, it, it's possible, there is a way, somehow, in verse 2, uh, we, we should understand that this means that there is some way that, uh, that we can come to a relationship with God where he will no longer count our iniquity against us. How do we get there? These uh, different words used for sin, they're, they're all, they're all ta it's all talking about sin. Uh, here we see this, this uh, the basic idea of, of sin is a fault, a, a lapse. Uh, that's often true in the Greek word that's especially common in the New Testament for sin. Uh, or to, to miss the target or, or to fail. The word transgression here means basically to break the law. Uh, and the word iniquity it is talking here about guilt, uh, and so we find that we are uh, we've failed, we've we've fallen, we've we've missed the mark, we've fallen short, we've broken God's law, and we're guilty. All, all those you know, uh, sin, transgression, iniquity, and and it piles up against us. And when we begin to embrace this truth about ourselves, and no longer hide from it, and no longer run from it. Uh, we're beginning to meet the first condition for true happiness. I know that doesn't make sense yet, but bear with me. I hope it will. Uh, the second thing here is there's there's nothing here about being happy if only we don't get caught. If only we, we manage to never fail. If only our serious flaws are never discovered. That, that This is not the way this psalm describes a happy person. This isn't about perfect people. And it's not about hiding. There is no happiness in hiding from the truth about yourself forever. That's that's misery. But this says, happy is the man, but blessed is the one in our translation. Blessed is the one. It's about normal human people, men and women just like you and me, uh, warts and all, uh, weaknesses and all, scars and, and shortcomings and character flaws and all. But the fact that we have all these failures and wrongs, according to this, is not a, an obstacle. It's not a bar to, to happiness. Uh, this is part of the human condition, is to have these deep flaws in us and these deep twisted wrongness in us. The, the, these things, it's like, it's like our moral compass has a, has a bad needle in it and is pointing the wrong way all the time. Uh, the fact that we've got this, this, these insatiable appetites uh, that you know you you put a person under stress and you'll begin to see what it is that they think makes them happy uh, by the thing they begin to go to so I, I found that during this COVID-19 pandemic um, I just about put on the COVID-19 in terms of gaining weight uh, and I had to begin to realize you know I have I have a problem that when I'm when I'm depressed and discouraged and feeling shut in and feeling unhappy uh, you know, it's it's become way too easy for me to, you know, uh, get a bowl of Tostitos chips and salsa and try to make myself feel better. Uh, and that's not, there. there is obviously no happiness down that path. Um, there's just, you know, larger clothes, uh, and that's not happy either. Uh, but here, the, these things that are true about humans, that we all have deep-seated flaws and deep-seated hungers and longings and cravings that we look to things to make us happy to fill us to soothe us to calm us whatever the case may be and that that deep longing the lack uh, that we have inside of us is a is a root of sin it, it is i think the presence of sin in us that leads to that uh, that deep sense of need uh, a void a vacuum in us we're trying to fill um, and and the implication is here uh, is that 
hiding from our sin, hiding from the fact of the truth about ourselves is not the first step to happiness. Confessing it is. Realizing we've got the sin is the first step to happiness. And the second step to happiness is having that forgiven, having our, our, our massive, massive faults forgiven, our wrongs forgiven, our, our shortcomings forgiven, our law-breaking forgiven, our guilt forgiven and dealt with. So uh, to be happy uh, doesn't mean denying our faults and our wrongs. It means first facing them and secondly, finding help for them, finding forgiveness. And the implication here is that our admitting our wrongdoing is the first step to happiness. Uh, that becomes more clear in the next verse, in verse 3. David's, David writes this, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was so heavy upon me. Paraphrasing there. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. With that word selah uh, that's in your text there, it, it means to, uh, we believe it means to take a pause. It's a notation to say pause here and, and let that sink in. And so I'll end uh, with that verse today and pick up the rest of the psalm uh, tomorrow. But what I want to say here is that the second uh, uh, very, very important step towards happiness is uh, is not to hide from our sin and, and never admit our transgressions, our sin, our iniquity, but to confess it. And David here is looking back on the, the, the terrible life lesson that he learned from his own experience, where he learned that as long as he hid his sin and denied his sin and, and pretended it, it wasn't a problem, he was miserable. And verses 3 and 4 show that, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, my groaning all day long, Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. His strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. And he's referring to his uh, terrible sin with the, the first the adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, we read about that in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Uh, first the adultery with Bathsheba. But then uh, when he tried to cover that up, he had Bathsheba's husband killed in war. Put him in the front line so that he was killed first and uh, deliberately plotted that uh, in order to cover up his adultery with, with Uriah's wife Bathsheba. Uh, of course, uh, Bathsheba became pregnant by King David, um, and uh, uh, sometime when the child was very young, the prophet Nathan came to David and began to confront him and sort of tricked him into, into uh, uh, condemning himself. Um, and, and, when, and then David finally broke down and, and, and said, you know, uh, uh, forgive me my sins. And, and Nathan the prophet said, your sins are forgiven. God will forgive you your sins uh, for your confession of it. But, but there was still a consequence to be paid. In this situation, as David hid his sin for so long, and long enough for Bathsheba to, to carry out a pregnancy, to have a child, uh, months, months, if not years, uh, David said during that whole time when I kept silent my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long there was no happiness in hiding from his sin there was no peace in fact it was the opposite it was turmoil inside him day and night your hand was heavy upon me he's referring to God's hand my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer I just no real thriving at all very much the opposite and imagine the guilt and the stress that David felt during that time. And that's probably not hard for you to imagine. That's probably not hard for any of us to imagine. We've probably, go, we've probably been through this. Our sin may not be on the level of uh, adultery and murdering, uh, but it, it's just as serious. Our sin is just as serious in terms of an, a, a, a resisting God, a falling short of the mark, uh, a breaking of God's law, a guilt because of how we stand before him. Uh, our sin is serious. And here there's a crisis here. David comes to the point where he, he uh, says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. And yet, you see, he didn't always keep silent because verse 1 and 2 said, happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man, happy is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Finally, David came to a place by the time he wrote this psalm where verse 3 was no longer true, 
where he was no longer, uh, according to verse 2, there was no longer this deceit in his spirit. He wasn't lying to himself. He wasn't hiding his sin from God. He was free again. And he was free because he'd found forgiveness through God. Uh, I, I, want, I want you to be sure this morning that uh, to make no mistake that God leads us through these times of great turmoil and great inner stress and great depression even while we uh, fail to confess our sin and while we try to hide from our sin and try to find happiness apart from being reconciled to God. But there is no happiness down that way. We can't find peace until we first admit our sin, confess it, and second, seek God's forgiveness. The promise here is that as verses 1 and 2 show us, uh, show us uh, almost a, uh, almost as uh, as a biography of David's life in a snapshot that David found that forgiveness that God was willing to forgive his sin now my friends I want to remind you that as we've been looking a lot at the gospel uh, the truth of the promise of Jesus Christ that by his death our sins are nailed to the cross for all who believe in him who put our hopes and our trust in him we depend upon Jesus and what he did uh, in his death and resurrection our sin is removed from us the guilt of our sin is taken away from us forever and and we're forgiven we're reconciled to god you can know the same happiness that david describes in verse one and two simply by believing in jesus christ that through his death and resurrection your sins are dealt with once and for all uh, tomorrow we're going to carry on and look at the rest of the psalm and how this leads us to uh, to fully step into the happiness God designs for us. And uh, I invite, I ask you to come back and, and see tomorrow's video as we look at Psalm 32, verses 5 and on. Let's pray. Father, uh, this morning I pray a special blessing on those who are watching this video uh, that uh, you would do some heart surgery. Lord, I, I pray that you would uh, give the, the confidence under your Holy Spirit that it's time it's time for us to begin to face the sin in our own hearts and to stop hiding it from ourselves and stop hiding it from you most of all. That, Lord, you would lead us to confess our sins to you, to name them as much as we are able to, uh, to probe uh, deeply if we need to, Lord, and, and remember what we've been hiding from and the truth we've been refusing to admit even to ourselves so that we can confess these things to you, so that we can admit, Lord, how we have fallen short of your glory, how we have missed the mark in terms of uh, how we should have been, the kinds of people and the, the sort of things we should have done, and Lord, how we've broken your law. We have uh, so many times deliberately overstepped uh, what your scripture says we ought to do and ought not to do, and Lord, how we have put ourselves in a position where we truly are guilty. It's not just a feeling, it's a fact of legal, impl legal culpability that we are guilty before you. So Lord, this morning, gently, but, but powerfully, uh, would you lead us to recognize our sin, recognize our transgression, recognize our iniquity, and then trust in Jesus that because he died in the place of sinners, it's all taken away from us. It's removed from us once and for all to begin to find that freedom and that first step towards happiness, Lord, as you forgive our sins, as you've promised to do so. You forgive our sins just because we believe in you. Lord, we thank you for this great promise and the great hope that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you make that hope come to fruition in the days that come? As we carry on in Psalm 32, Lord, would you teach us to be children who are happy, free, and forgiven through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We ask this, that you would cause us to keep growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, until he comes again. And in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me this morning. I pray that you'll come back and watch tomorrow's video uh, and find out how this can be true for you. Until then, God bless you.